Merci pour l'invitation, mais je dois parler anglais. Mon français n'est pas assez bon. Pour vous, c'est un désastre si je parle français, quand je parle français. And um, if I'm, I'm talking about voluptas, it wasn't so easy for me to understand what you really mean with voluptas. And so I decided to show you, in a way, about more about our thinking than about our projects. And what I try to explain architects, because I'm teaching architects or architectural students, landscape architecture, that's not so easy, believe me, because this young people are about 23, 26, and the first time they hear anything about landscape, about paradise, and they have completely romantic uh, impressions, especially coming for, uh, or working or living in Switzerland. So we always start explaining what is behind paradise, and it's Pairidesa, this Persian expression before all religion. Uh, before um, the Jewish, Christian, or Islamic religion. It was a, a description, uh, it's about 2,000 years old, what is uh, par par uh, before paradise, what is paradise? Uh, and it's, it's, it's really easy. Uh, you need a perimeter, you need a threshold, an entrance, and you need water, vegetation, a choreography, how to walk through this paradise, and a metaphor. <coughs> and now you see, now you have <coughs> paradise. <coughs> but now it's becoming much more and more complex, and it's not so easy to <coughs> explain what is the difference between architecture and landscape architecture. And I think it's, it's especially for young people not having a lot of experience with uh, as as my generation had it, especially in Switzerland, <coughs> we were all with our parents walking in the mountains. We had a, somehow an experience of landscape. And today, young people don't have any experience of landscape, of walking, of physical body-related experiences. And especially architectural students, so they don't see the difference between such a building as an object seen from outside, inside. They can easily work with the model but you can see it today outside, it's completely different if you work with landscape. You have the open sky, you have weather condition, it's a completely different approach. And we are working a lot with models, but for me it's a problem that we have more and more people, for instance in Zurich at the ETH we have 25% German pe uh, students and 20% from Asia. And how can we talk in so different cultures about space, perception of space? And it's so, how can I explain it? Let's say he, we, we all in this uh, uh, conference, we, we really understand the space. It's here, the windows, and the roof in here. But when I'm talking with Asians, especially Japanese students, they have a completely different perception of space. So, for, the, for them, the space is not this, what we have since Descartes, we have it here in Europe, but for the Japanese, it's this relationship you have with me, so I'm talking to you, you are listening to me. So that's a completely different approach to the idea or perception of space. And especially in landscape architecture, it's not so easy to work with it. And you know, I'm criticizing landscape architects that they are graphic designers, they're always 2D, two-dimensional. You know it, and uh, you have always have running tracks out of orange asphalt, and you have all these ornaments in the surfaces, and it's just not interesting. And all my students are starting like that. And when I show, after Paradise, I show you, it's only a, a little bit explaining how we work when we work professionally. That's a, a wall about nine meters long, about two meters high. Uh, it's for a concept we worked on in Turkey for 18 different courtyards in a big de development in Istanbul. It's how we call it, we call it uh, um, in the studio, uh, concept cartography. And it's, it's really a cartographic system when we start, before we start design, you always start with this idea of cartography. And when, <coughs> when you work with uh, American or Anglo-Saxon students or people, they are constantly talking about mapping. 
And when I had uh, students in Harvard last uh, fall, especially the Asian students, they produced one, South Korean students produced 280 maps, but no design, only mapping. And they really believe in mapping, that mapping is designing. And uh, perhaps two or three students really built a physical model. And I explained them how to build a physical model so they have to, to do it, to have a relationship between an object and a model and a an idealistic landscape and reality. It's <coughs> and we work in our studio with big models, with the students, all with these models, like all architects in Switzerland, or many of the architects are working like that. And landscape architects always think they cannot work with model because it's, the scale is too big. But then I, I say, the model has to be much bigger. So and it's always easier to understand space through a model. And <coughs> at the same time, I think we should all, because we are quite in a privileged situation in Switzerland, uh, Marcel Miley once uh, uh, said in a lecture, the Swiss architecture is as good because our, our fees are so high. So we can work much more than, let's say, in Germany or in England or wherever. So we should, we should really make more profit out of it. And what we are doing every year, one or two uh, projects without any, any profit. So that's one of it, where we produce an exhibition for uh, the Swiss Embassy in London asked us to produce a small exhibition about the Swiss perception of landscape, of the English landscape. And we were interested in this landscape in Dartmoor, south of England or south of London, where you have this kind of rocks, stones in the landscape. So where, you, where you're constantly walking up, you always see it like that. And when you are on top, you're looking down and you have a completely different perception of the landscape. It's, of course, it's not really a mountain, it's a hilly landscape, but absolutely beautiful. And, and there's a perception of, of landscape is completely different than, let's say, in a Swiss mountain, mountain area. And so we, we try to explain what is the difference between to look at and to look out. And the year before, we did it with uh, Vauban in France, with all these different fortification buildings you have in France, in the Alps, along the Atlantic, in the Alsace. It's always the same time, but in different landscapes. And how does it fit to the landscape? And for us, this kind of Exp of tests, experiences are uh, very influential for our work in the office. And then, of course, you have to bring it, to, it's a little bit like Robert Smith, in site and non-site. You can work in the landscape on site and non-site when you work in a gallery. How can you transform it, this perception, into a gallery space in a very urban uh, situation? And then we studied this um, panorama building. Here have one, perhaps you know this one in Tunes, or it's on one in Lucerne, where you have these 360 degrees panorama or paintings, and you can walk around and turn yourself. And so we started to, to work with this idea of a building, like here, how could we explain this landscape in an exhibition space? And of course, we did a lot of tests and what, so in, in between architecture and landscape architecture. And uh, for us, it was interesting because the panorama building is, in a way, uh, an artificial landscape as itself and its architecture. And of course, uh, in our office, we have uh, always architects working with us. And by the way, they are the, be the better designers and landscape architects. They don't know enough about vegetation and trees, but therefore they have me, so because I know enough about vegetation. But the architects are much much more thinking in an abstract way. It's say really, and they are in a way coming as students or as young professionals in our office. They are in a good way naive in relation to landscape, and I really like to work with these young architects. So we go out and we really do it ourselves. Like here, a, a, an architect, a young architect, who then uh, worked on this project, on this exhibition, and produce this photo and of course <coughs> in the exhibition space 
what is the relationship, how can you understand the position in the real landscape, and in the end we decided to produce this kind of, <coughs> of walls hanging from the ceiling, so where you have to make a little bit like that, and entering, and then you see, like in the landscape, you look out, and uh, from outside you look at, and of course we have lost and found pieces of the landscape in, a, in this kind of wunderkammer just nearby. So it was all about this perception of a specific uh, English landscape. When I'm talking about England, for me it's, it's a bit paradise, a little bit, because um, when we are talking about voluptas, the English people say have really an erotic, erotic relationship to landscape. They really love grass, lawn, gardens, they really love it. I don't know any other culture like the English. They really, everybody knows uh, so many things about gardens, about plants, about vegetation. So it's wonderful to work there somehow, but it's well, very, as, as urban, in an urbanistic sense, it's very difficult because it's a real capitalistic uh, society. So for instance, we got this, this uh, job for the Olympic villages, so three parks, two plazas, all street spaces, it was a direct contract. Or the, we made a project for, for um, the big plaza in front of the parliament in London, between the Buckingham Palace and the parliament. It was a direct contract. I couldn't imagine that the Swiss government would give any English office a direct contract to design the Bundesplatz in Bern. But they don't have a program. That's their problem. They don't have an idea in a contemporary sense. That's why the British landscape architects are so, in a way, conservative, I think. They don't have a program or an idea how to transform uh, landscape and after the Olympics, uh, the city of London invited Chris Christian, my colleague from the ETH in Zurich, as an urban planner, as a moderator for this process. And we, as landscape architects, we were the urban planners. And five architects did small project wi within our urban planning concept. And it's really strange that this perception, the English perception. That, it, that even a city is related to a landscape. That's why I show you this project in <coughs> West London. On the left edge, you can see Heathrow Airport, and the red line uh, shows uh, a new park. It will be the biggest park in London in the next 25 years. Again, a direct commission. And <coughs> I couldn't believe it's so big and I couldn't believe uh, it's an agricultural used land, and it's a, it's a dense city around, it's a, a very low class uh, people living there, Bangladeshi, Pakistani people uh, going there by, uh, with the tube. You don't believe, you really think you don't end in London, it, it's really like in Pakistan or in Bangladesh, it's really, it's no longer London, but nevertheless, as there is a, a demand, and <coughs> you see it's part, again, it's on the left-hand side, it's in the green belt. Uh, London still has this big system around London. It's uh, about 100 kilometer the distance between north, south, east, west, and it's part of this park uh, system in West London. And what is it? Why? Uh, do they want to build a park? It's because they would like to dig out gravel to produce concrete for the next 25, 30 years. And, and therefore, they will create a space underneath. And uh, of course, it's, it's just not possible to dig it out and to have a hole around in, in this neighborhood. And also, uh, people living in the neighborhood are saying, OK, we agree. But then we want to have a park from the beginning. That means we will take the soil away, drill holes in it, and then pour concrete, build a park on top, and then take the gravel underneath. And only to show the dimensions, that's uh, the Amazon storage space in London. 
and it will set the biggest storage space in Europe, and it's 10 times bigger than the existing Amazon. And nobody really knows how to use such a big space. And the last uh, information I got said they will install servers from the government, uh, secret service, because you have a, an airport just nearby, so you have high security, uh, sit, situa situation, so it's it's easy to bring other things like server farms and uh, and uh, producing this kind of environment, and that's showing <coughs> again England. England was a, a, um, a colonial country. There you get maps you don't believe. The best uh, documentation about everything uh, you can even really imagine. And so, of course, it was, so we did a, first of all, we, we took out a little bit of this gravel to really to see it, to make it physical to our people, what, what is underneath. And we, we are working now for about two years and we don't have, we don't really have a, a design. I will show it afterwards. We have, in a way, a protocol of this two, two years. And I have to say, I'm really happy with our clients that he's waiting for our design because people living in the neighborhood again when we are talking about voluptas see they are expecting a wonderful park like Hyde Park in James Park or uh, Green Park in in central London but uh, in the reality it's part of the and uh, let's say a really wonderful neighborhood park but in reality it's a it's a landscape situation with the green belt where you have this kind of really extensive parks it's, it's <coughs> something in between a landscape and uh, a, and a park and it's it's for people living in the whole of london so biking walking not only for the neighbors so you have the two different demands one is from all londoners to have a somehow a landscape or some to more a landscape than a park and the direct neighborhood is asking for a for a neighborhood park let's say but then again if you uh, we didn't design it so we we told our client we have to deal with processes and that's for me the future that we have to deal with with uh, these with the engineers uh, with these soil processes how can we afford enough soil for this park with the water management because it's all on top of, a, of this kind of storage space. Social processes and vegetation, so you have to plant a lot of trees and it's just not possible to buy trees in a nursery. How can we afford this dimension and, and therefore we are much more interested in, in, uh, in this kind of processes. And of course, again, uh, mapping in, in London is easy because they have everything. So here is uh, what we found out that, that there are se sequences of different parks coming from starting with Hyde Park, James Park, Green Park, Richmond Park, and this kind of traditional parks going out and ending in the Green Belt. And again, here it's amazing. When you know London, it's all built. It's really a dense urban city. You can really have a, find a map showing the landscape in London underneath the urban uh, fabric. They still have this idea that there is on, on the in the beginning, or you can really feel uh, these different types of landscape. And of course, there is a little bit topography. You can really find topographical situations in London. And so we have to talk with these people about their culture, with their maps, otherwise they will never uh, agree. And here, what it's really not a design. On on top, you see it's a bit a different uh, shapes and on the but bottom and top, it's more this kind of neighborhood parks, more with sports activities, and in the south, it's more uh, uh, a productive landscape. Let's say it's still a bit agriculture, it's uh, perhaps a bit of a nursery, but mainly agriculture. 
and uh, allotments and on top it's more this kind of neighborhood parks uh, so these two types of park relating to the green belt or to the na neighborhood and um, <coughs> so Heathrow is just on the left hand end and uh, you can imagine so you have every 50 second big airplane landing or starting and then every half an hour so you're changing a little bit so it's 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 loud or it's not loud, but they are close, you can nearly touch them. So it's just not an easy neighborhood, and, but you see the dimension. And uh, we have to build it from the beginning, so it's interesting. And it's, uh, for me, it's just not possible to just design it in such a, such a, a big scale. And we really have to deal processes. And I think that will be the future, because I think we will work more and more in these big dimensions. We especially see it in France, that this big scale is coming back in the landscape. We are dealing around big metropolitan areas. We have to deal with big scale projects. And it's no longer agriculture, it's no longer forests, it's no, no longer a traditional park. And we have to find <coughs> out how can we deal with it. And I think it's much more a, 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 a social process and a design process. Then <coughs> this uh, project, this stadium in M Munich, I only show it because we are always interested to have to have a, a discussion with the public. And here with the stadium, it was easy because, of course, uh, the sit people living in Munich they were, were interested to have a new stadium. They already had a wonderful one. The Olympic Stadium in Munich is really a beautiful uh, uh, design, but it's not good for football. It's good for athletics, but it's not uh, so good for football. And it was <coughs> the working together with architects here, Herzog and Dermot, it was for me so interesting because in the beginning, in the competition, there was a brief saying, we have the stadium, and the stadium has to be like that, and it's, it, it can only be like that. All the other teams uh, positioned it in a similar way, but the difference to all the other architects was <coughs> that we, 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 you don't see any car parking spaces, I mean buildings, so all the others had three buildings for about 4,000 each 4,000 car parking spaces. And in the first meeting I said, but listen, we cannot have uh, this kind of church and then in front of a church to have this kind of inf in infrastructure building. And then Jacques asked me, but where, where are all the car parking? And then I said, we have a dam along the motorways, seven meters high, why, why not hide it and establish a new landscape? And so that what, that's what we built, because you see it on the left hand on top, there is a military or both a former military training field and with a specific uh, vegetation hazard, so you know it, so you need sheep and uh, to keep it like that, and of course all the tanks, and it was a, a forbidden city. And so on the right hand side, a small hill with all the... the, the after the Second World War, coming out of Munich, all these destroyed buildings, and it's, it's really a hill, so like, like a two landmarks, and of course a lot of traffic. Mm -hmm. And you have two times a week when Munich is playing in the Champions League, as they do nearly every year. And um, but so you have two two uh, games every week for then I would say it's for three four hours. And then the rest of the week, it's for <coughs> people living in the neighborhood. And it's really a, it's not a real park because it's outside of the city. And then we decided it should be interesting for these people living around. And of course, we did a lot of research about these uh, plants in the military, military training field because they are really good for, to have them on top of a car parking or to have it on seven or ten centimeters of soil. So we, we collected seeds there and we did a lot of research with botanists and we really collected seeds from the, the neighborhood. 
And of course, you have to bring the rainwater down. It, it's all, in a way, super ecological, but you don't see it. I think, in terms of design, it's we are always interested to work in a sustainable way, to work in an ecological way, but one shouldn't see it in the design. It, it should be clear that you deal with it, but one shouldn't uh, uh, see it. So it, it was, uh, in the end, we planted uh, about one million plants, and the rest was the seed we brought out. And of course, we did a lot of research, how should the soil look like? And in the end, it looked like us. It was black, it looked like asphalt. So it's really a surface going up and uh, to the stadium. That's three months after the opening. And of course, it was a little bit related to the idea of the English landscape garden. So this uh, choreography, how can you approach to the stadium on one hand, but when you use it, when you're not interested in football and you use it on your free time and to walk to the landscape behind, it should be like a park, so, so leading you out and you have views out into the landscape on top of this, uh, uh, in the end it's a car parking for 12,000 meters. Again, like in London, we are more, in the old days it was only, only in Switzerland and we worked on top of uh, car parking spaces or whatever was underneath and I, as a student, Luigi Nazi told us, you know, one should always see that um, there, when there is an artificial situation and I agree and he told us, yeah, you know, a tree should grow, the roots should grow to the middle of the earth, it's a bit hot there, but Today uh, I couldn't I couldn't work because we are I would say 80 percent of our projects are super artificial, not related to real earth, and that's not so easy. How can you deal with it? And of course, <coughs> this choreography is related to to the football fans. Let's say when the Germans are playing against the Dutch, then it's you have to separate it or. Bayern against Manchester United, it's like super critical. So <coughs> they use horses to, to divide the fence. And that's the other side uh, with the special vegetation with the hazard. It's the same plants you can find on top of the uh, car parking is on the other side. And the same plants here uh, maintained through sheep and on the other side with machines. And of course, what I mentioned, we were interested to have a, somehow a public discussion about it. And so we showed it in an architectural museum in Munich. They asked us to show the project. And then we showed what our ideas w was were. And, and of course, to, to show a little bit the wunderkammer behind. Because talking about nature, is, it's not only um, talking about aesthetics, it's really to open a little bit our wunderkammer to show how we think, how we work, and to bring together, to explain how this construction was done. And here it's a machine normally used for vegetable planting. And of course showing uh, in the exhibition the visitors what they don't see. For instance, on night time, what kind of animals are living on in this big esplanade and uh, so what, what people normally don't see and uh, uh, explaining what's behind the plants and <coughs> not only design issues but really to explain the nature because I think today many people they don't have any idea what nature really means and there is a big desire uh, for nature but sometimes <coughs> I don't really understand what is what do people ask for? Because it's somehow so artificial that it's not really nature. But I think in the future we will have to deal with it. And of course we are we are working with, uh, mainly with architects. Sometimes we have a project like this park where we are uh, working alone or with specialists, engineers, and more and more we are working with artists. <coughs> when the artists are 
um, focused on a scene, let's say in the 80s, many artists worked uh, uh, or, or had projects with furniture in the 90s it was more architecture and today it's really landscape, garden, nature and uh, <coughs> I'm interested to, de to deal with artists but as a landscape architect I have to say I'm proud to be a landscape architect, I don't want to be an architect, I never wanted to, to draw a building and I never did it until today and I never did a piece of art and here it was, uh, we are working quite often together with Olafur Eliasson, who is in his artwork always inter interested in perception of, of perception as it itself, so landscape, uh, nature, and that was our first col collaboration, it was the start of his international career where we had, we had a discussion about the concept, how can we uh, show nature in a in a, in a gallery, and that's in Bregenz, with, uh, in the Museum of Peter Zumthor, and uh, where we showed, <coughs> he started, uh, or he asked me, I would like to show gardens, landscape, nature, and I said, okay, you're talking about three different, completely different things. What are we talking about? Is it a garden inside, or what is it? And in the end, it was a a discussion about natural phenomena and um, <coughs> and uh, we really had the contact within one day discussion we found out what to do and how uh, how to to work with nature and again of course you can uh, I learned a lot from the artist that it's not done uh, enough when you produce a, a piece of work or you show it, you have to have a discussion. You are, you are responsible to, to discuss with people and, and to have a discussion. Here, Olafur wrote a letter to Peter Zumthor and he didn't really like the exhibition and uh, because um, Olafur told him, you know, this kind of exhibition space is so artistic it's so difficult to show art inside. Why did you design it like that? And of course he never answered, but um, he was really a bit uh, upset, and I'm working with Peter Zumthor as well, but it's, it's and I can understand uh, the artist working there, for instance, when I saw the exhibition of uh, Helmut Federle, who is working really large paintings, they really disappeared in this concrete, uh, on these concrete walls. So I told, um, and uh, Olafur asked me how you are working with architects, how would you deal with this kind of architecture? And I told him, don't do anything in the space, don't do anything on the wall, it should all be on the floor. It's the only chance you have, you have, you have to, to really to, to go underneath, not on top, you have to go underneath, that means only works on the, on the floor and nothing in the space, nothing against the wall, so that's the easiest way to deal with such a museum. And of course here we, this was the invitation card, where <coughs> we had a, a public discussion with people coming to the museum, coming to the exhibition, and they all asked us, why do, do you so show these catastrophes, this natural catastrophe? And then we explained it's because it's not a natural ca catastrophe, it's a, it's a catastrophe that we, that we build too much in the Alps, in Austrian Alps, and the water is coming too fast, and then we have this, this kind of, of floods. To establish a kind of, of, um, of discussion. And then in the first floor, we had these uh, mushrooms, it's a bit like remaining to a forest because <coughs> when, when we are talking about natural phenomena, I told Olafur, we have to relate to people, that means people should easily understand what you are showing, how can you show a forest and it's only the, the, these uh, sticks of wood and everyday mushrooms growing out and of course they were taken away and Olafur made an interview saying they are poisonous but nevertheless they were every day taken away because it was uh, simple shiitake mushrooms you can buy in every supermarket and people st 
stolen it, they of course know that it's not poisonous. And it was just in front of the people selling the tickets and they never found out who was, I think it was somebody for, from the museum, but I'm not sure. And then we showed simple things like fog in the museum, that means instead of taking the air out, we blow fog into the museum. And it was, again, it was mediated motions, it was about choreography, and it was about the phenomenon, normally people in, uh, uh, let's say, in Vorarlberg, in Austria, and Bregenz don't really like a foggy situation, but in the museums they were so impressed to have a weather condition, a real weather condition, I mean a museum in the fog and walking in the fog and not on, on the museum ground. And, the <coughs> and then you have a lot of ditches, canals in, in, uh, for irrigation of the landscape. So we, we only use these plants, these green plants, um, growing on top of this water. And again, mediated motion. It's, um, it's you have to follow the hour tracks. You, you cannot walk through the museum as you normally can. You can see the paintings on the wall. But now you have to walk on on this uh, footpath we, we propose. And the last one was then oops, that we established a kind of rammed earth, a real soil, but instead of flat, it was a bit sloping down, uh, quite steep. It one, was one meter higher on one hand on one side, so people were a bit astonished how, why is it not, uh, not like we have it here, so you have to walk down or to walk up. Again, there, there was no um, footpath leading you through, you were completely free to walk on it. And of course we transformed the architecture, here is the staircase, all visitors are related to this staircase and we made it more narrow, so you are already in the entrance, there is a, a, a transformation of the uh, uh, perception you normally have knowing uh, this museum. <coughs> when I'm talking about this kind of, that we are more and more working in artificial situation, I show now two projects, we are working with trees and in a special way. So. There was a time, like here, Caspar David Friedrich, this German painter in the Rom Romantic time, where <coughs> these trees are, by the way, not natural. They, they are really treated in a special way, that they look like that, or like that. It's <coughs> even uh, the conservation, garden conservation people in Germany treat trees nowadays like that, so they look like that, especially oak trees. It, it, in those days it was, it was seen as super natural, but in reality they were treated like, like an agricultural uh, treatment. It was really not, not natural, so they cut it, the trees, so they, they looked really like romantic or natural. So we had we worked on a project in the center of Switzerland in, in Zug or near Zug, and um, <coughs> again it was uh, uh, in a super artificial situation, and we found out that is in, on this side there were some million, eighty million years ago, it was a completely different uh, uh, vegetation. You can imagine it's mammoth trees, the kind of vegetation you can find today in Northern uh, America or Canada and some of them even in Asia. So that was uh, vegetation uh, 80 million years ago and uh, you can still find it um, underneath but let's say 100 meters deeper. So this vegetation and we wanted to, to relate to these kind of strange trees. You, Today you find it in a botanical garden or whatever. And um, of course, dealing with this kind of ideas, we had to have an ex um, exchange with the people working there. And this was for Roche, the pharma company. So you have <coughs> a lot of scientists. And from the beginning, we started in the, in the 
company newspaper, a discussion with the people, what are we doing there? So it's not so like a piece of art, take it or leave it. So we started a discussion what we are doing and people were more and more interested to have a discussion with, with us before we even constructed it. So we did a, a lot of research, what kind of trees we were interested in. And of course we wanted a little bit break the scale. So we have uh, normal trees here, but when we are talking about big trees, so we really wanted to show it's a big tree. If you are talking about a big mammal tree you can find in California today up to 130 meters. So we did a lot of tests, how could we build these artificial trees and how and with what, what's the right material. And of course we, <coughs> and, and the scale of course, and um, I'm going quick through. And of course in the end it's out of concrete, but it's about uh, 28 meters long and it's quite big, a big scale. And it was a production like in a laboratorium, what people working say, there are doing in their labs, we did it outside. And it was <coughs> on site, the construction, so people could see, so we built a tent, and like a, a lab outside, where we built this kind of, of uh, trees, about seven of these huge trees. And of course in the end, we painted them, so they look like that. And so <coughs> we pl planted the real mammal trees, so the trees you see there, these are the real trees, and lying down, these are the artificial trees. And people are sitting there, and <coughs> it was really interesting for me to have a, this discussion with these people, and people wrote us emails, asked questions, and they have a, an exchange with us. What what is going on? What is the idea behind? I think in the future we should work much more in this kind of exchange or discussion exchange. And even in architecture, sometimes I think we should be much more open because we built such a building in those days when when this kind of building was built. It was strange. Today we all like it. We we love it. But I think we should explain ourselves much more uh, to people not knowing anything about landscape architecture <coughs> or architecture. And till today we get uh, uh, emails and uh, questions. In a similar way, again in the center of Berlin, just a, a work we, are, we started with Olafur in the center of uh, Berlin, a courtyard. And of course, <coughs> for me, it's a bit difficult because all these courtyards we have in our office, and meanwhile, I don't have any idea what to do. I did in the, in the hotel hired something with Marcel Meile and Markus Peter. We, we established a moss landscape, and then another courtyard, we did a, a dense forest out of birch trees, stems, stems like that, but meanwhile I really don't have any idea what to do. I have so <coughs> built so many courtyards. Nevertheless, we have to, we always have this kind of, especially in such a dense situation, especially in Berlin where you have so many courtyards. So again, <coughs> we try to find out what is really specific in this courtyard. And, and so we worked, how is the relationship between the courtyard and the outside, and it, it is a bit kaleidoscopic, and then we found out we cannot <coughs> have any soil on top of this courtyard, so because there is no space for any soil, so but the client expected um, uh, uh, it's somehow a green courtyard, and invited Olafur Eliasson to connect two buildings with a passerelle and a piece of art, and he c connected it through a passerelle out of glass and different windows. So I thought, okay, if we are not able to deal with plants and vegetation, why not deal with animals? And so we started, and peacocks for instance, but morning at six you cannot survive because they are so loud, you have to <coughs> cut them, and it's not really fair to cut it, but they are so beautiful, I thought, why not having peacocks in the center of Berlin? 
And then we thought we could have pigeons. <coughs> That's a project we did with a young artist. Um, he's from Lyon and he's uh, working in Berlin. And I invited him for the Biennale, for the Common Ground. He's a wonderful artist. He's a typical Swiss artist with a lot of humor. And so he catched 100 pigeons on the Piazza San Marco and colored them with, uh, with uh, blue, red, and yellow. And I was, it was difficult with the police in Italy for me, not for him. And uh, <coughs> then you could see them flying, because he brought them back on the Piazza San Marco and everybody seeing a blue pigeon. It was a, <laughs> but it's only for three months and he did a lot of good things for them, taking out all the the things they have in, and, and the color is not dangerous, not poisonous. But it was for me so interesting. I saw a boy like that and he was so, what is this? And then it's, it's really interesting when you change some perception. So we thought, why not establish pigeons in this uh, courtyard? And there, is a, <coughs> there was always a strong relationship between these animals, in, especially in urban situations. You still have it in Iran, for instance, where you have big towers where they produce shit from the pigeons. It's perfect to grow certain vegetables or in the Nile Valley in Egypt. You still have it, this kind of special buildings for pigeons, but in urban situation. And we thought that could be something, but the client found it a good idea, but not only animals. So you have to deal with plants. So then, again, how we work, we started with, uh, we always start with a table, and I have a big wunderkammer, meaning I have a lot of objects, uh, plants, animals, uh, stones, whatever you can, and a lot of models. And sometimes we bring it together on a table to start the discussion, really only as a, then you can say, okay, couldn't it be interesting, we do it in a different way, and uh, so in this kind of, of discussion, it's it's not as an impression. So you have something on the table, and then you ask, but why do do you bring this object? And then we can really start a discussion before all the design. So <coughs> that's uh, uh, that's I have to explain. It sets the connection between the two buildings out of glass, and these are mirrors. So going out uh, into or crossing this courtyard, of course, it's interesting to see this mirroring effect. And therefore, the client asked for, for green, whatever. And then we said, OK, then we may make it super extreme. And we, instead of uh, artificial uh, trees, we, we have branches. And it's much more abstract. We will, we will do like an artificial construction underneath where you never know what it is and it's done two weeks ago so we are not so far and you see this this uh, mirroring system and of course all the the soil would be like a, like a flying carpet you would the climbing plants are not coming from underneath they have to be on top because we don't have soil enough space for soil, so we will have it in this kind of abstract, half natural, half artificial construction underneath. And it will not look like a tree, it's a bit related to the Tiergarten in Berlin, where we saw this kind of nature, especially here in the middle one, where you have really wilderness, so it's a, a really a different world in this uh, courtyard, and we propose to have plants you can eat, so people going into the courtyard, working there, reading there, whatever, they can so can catch something and eat it, but uh, strawberries, whatever it is. And for us it's more and more important to have this kind of direct contract of nature. It's not only aesthetic, so you recognize you can eat it, it's for you. And of course still we have the, the birds, the pigeons. You see it? It's, uh, in the evening in here, and we would like to have it. I saw it this in the Mies van der Rohe, not the, the Miro Museum in Barcelona. They had in the opening ceremony, I think, two or three hundred white pigeons, and they are still there. And it's a wonderful 
uh, story to see it because people are feeding them and uh, it's, it's, re it's still relating to the opening, I don't know, 30 years ago. So the last one, <coughs> urban food. And when I'm saying I'm more and more into what, what is Voluptas, what is the future, I think the landscape of the future, even if it's an urban landscape, it has to become more and more productive. And <coughs> the students at ETH, they are all producing, um, or even the students of Olafur, like this student from the Romandia with these uh, pigeons, he, he's dealing with this kind of food in, or productive landscape in an in, in, uh, urban situation. And the students at the ETH asked me, they, they always proposed allotment gardens, uh, vegetable gardens, and so on. And, and it was always so romantic. Okay, I offer a course now for urban agriculture or urban food. The only problem is they are so, and the ETH paid on, on a roof, uh, an experimental garden, and I did it with the students, and they are so brilliant. They are working like crazy. You know, I only have one problem. Students don't cook. So I have to eat all myself because they are only growing and then uh, tomorrow they will all work there, but they will never get because they eat pizza. And you know, if they, they have to work a lot, they don't they tell me, yeah, we don't have time to cook and we are not able to cook. But they are interested on in this production and I think I have to help them so to explain what does it mean urban foods and worldwide is it's not important to have um, food production, it's less than 1% worldwide, but it's worldwide a movement and it's part of the urban planning because it's for me it's more a social process than really production of uh, food. It's bringing people together and I uh, and here you can see a, a, a map of uh, the Mediterranean area, why the Romans became so important. It has a lot to do, how can you feed people? And uh, Caroline Steele, I invited him to give a lecture. What's the difference between London and Paris in terms of food? And you know it all. Today, London is much more in interesting <coughs> to when you are interested in good food. It's much better than France. And it has to do with immigration and how to feed a city and why does Paris look like that and London look like that in relation to food. And so we are <coughs> dealing with the students and more and more it becomes part of uh, where, I, where I think urban planning, architecture and landscape architecture is coming together. And it shouldn't be too romantic. But for instance, here I asked one of my colleagues in the office explaining what happens when Günther Vogt starts the day in Zurich. So waking up, taking a shower, eating some fruit, a coffee, whatever. And it's interesting over the whole day, what is my implication locally, regional, national and international. And it's interesting to, to, to deal with the students uh, here in one of these allotments gardens. It's all on the on roof. And for instance, my people working in, um, in, in the London office, they, are not, they don't get enough money to buy this kind of food. We are buying here in the Coop, in the Negro, we can decide normal vegetables or biological vegetables. In London, it's much too expensive. <coughs> so therefore, they are not buying it, they give time, meaning so they are working on this kind of project. So, I don't know, five, six days a year, and they get vegetables for free. It's an exchange, no longer something and money, but it's time and you get something. And of course, I, again, it's like model making. I have to explain them. So sometimes they do it with honey, and they have to tell me it's from Zurich, it's from Ethiopia, it's from Sicily. And then they are saying, oh, it smells like wash water, so this kind of... Uh, Thing you need for one thing, I say it's inverse, it's, it's, it smells like citrus, but this washing water is smelling like citrus, and so honey is really nature, and so, and even I do it with olive oil as well, and then uh, they really have to give me a ranking, what 
10 different olive oil, what is number one, two, three, and you don't believe it, the most expensive, they always find the best quality, but they cannot describe why would they prefer this olive oil. They don't have a language for it. That's why I try to explain it to the students. And that's the last project related to this idea um, of, um, of, how can I say, this urban farming in a way, it's, it's, te it's a temporary landscape and I really don't like garden exhibitions as you know it, especially from Germany, this kind of temporary garden. And again, voluptas, a garden being temporary is not really a garden. But sometimes <coughs> we have to work temporarily. Like here, it's a, in the center of London, um, a recycling area, a recycling center. It's a very large area. And it will be established in the next 20, 30 years. And we saw, we thought, OK, it's, it's a constantly change of the urban grid, because they start building here and then here and so. And we found. So why not deal with it in a way that this kind of, instead of temporary gardens, we deal with the nursery, the production of trees for the city. And we found uh, a lot of examples. And this landscape has a lot of irrigation system and drainage system, so swales. Why not deal with this existing landscape and the production, again, a productive uh, landscape, uh, nursery, and we discussed it, of course, with the people living in the neighborhood, and they were so impressed that they can even use it as a, as a park and to explain to kids where the trees are coming from, how it is produced, and it's constantly changing over the next 15, 20 years. And as you can see it here, it's, it's constantly transformed. A lot of provisional buildings changed, taken away, built again. And so the trees as well, and the only idea I had was why not deal with the uh, production of nature, let's say tree production and nursery. And so it will be, or we already started to establish small trees and then a professional nursery will maintain it. And we found quite close to a different forests and looking a little bit like an old nursery and this kind of space you can find there, it is already in the, in the neighborhood. And of course to deal with different trees you can use afterwards, the trees in the city, in the city center of London or in the neighborhood. And uh, that's uh, the phases. And that's the last. <coughs> so. Uh, Again, about, about this idea of voluptas, it, it's changing, and I think it will change in the future. And it's not so easy to deal, especially as landscape architects. I think it's not so easy because we don't have a, a common ground uh, where we are discussing. Let's say, even in Switzerland, you have these different cultures. But leaving Switzerland, it's becoming more and more complex because everybody is talking from some something and meaning a completely different uh, thing, especially going leaving, let's say, leaving Europe and going to England, for instance. It's a completely different culture, and, and uh, it's not so easy to find out in the future what are people really expecting. And that's why I'm more and more interested in this kind of processes, social processes, but even urban, urban planning processes, and not only only design or aesthetic. Uh, of course, I'm still interested in design and aesthetic uh, approaches. But in the end, we have to come much closer to the people. And that, that's really for me the future. And then I see that's why I'm criticizing landscape architecture today. It's still too much in this aesthetics. And uh, nature and aesthetic is not so easy. And I think people today just don't understand sometimes what we are doing and what, what are we responsible for. And I think we should come back and take back our responsibility and then we have to go much closer to people than we did in the last 20, 30 years. Thank you.